Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and a very warm welcome to you where you are in the world today. My name is Phil Ball. I'm the host for today's webinar, which is focusing on network latency. I'm joined by Frank Puranic, one of our product specialists, who's going to go through network latency in detail. Uh, and there'll be a small demonstration as well with, with reference to the anyone network emulator. Today's webinar is scheduled to last approximately 20 minutes, including time allocated at the end for any questions that you may have. Um, to ask questions, please use the chat facility. I think most of you will find that it's actually towards the bottom of your screen. If you hover down there, you should be able to see the chat button there. As I said, if you could ask your questions via that, uh, and then we will address those when they come in towards the end of the session. The webinar is being recorded and it's our plan to make it available within the next 48 hours. So without any further delay, I'm going to hand across to Frank to start the presentation. Thank you, Frank. Thanks very much, Phil. So, um, when I started to think about this talk uh, on, on latency, I thought, yeah, there'll be no problem fitting it into a 20 minute or by the time Phil has done the introduction, about a 19 minute segment. And then uh, as I was writing, I realized just what a big topic this is. So uh, you'll, uh, you'll excuse us if we, uh, if we don't go into the full depth of it. I realized that could be uh, a half a day or a whole day. Um, these days, um, uh, these days, whatever industry you're in, uh, typically there is a network involved in your communication for your application. So your application running on uh, uh, running on some uh, client type equipment, uh, uh, going over networks like satellite networks, particularly if you're in defence, or the internet, or a WAN like MPLS. Uh, for typically, if you're if you're corporate, and then I've got the Wi-Fi um, kind of towers there, but that might represent a, a wireless ad hoc network again in defence, or it might represent if you like that last mile so I do show it going Wi-Fi from or wireless from end to end but that's not so common perhaps it might be a wireless last mile and then the internet or something like that so in other words not just those plain circuit there might be a mixture of those it doesn't really matter which of those circuits you have in the end uh, they uh, they have some constraints on them and different characteristics different amounts of link speed there may be congestion in those circuits there's uh, certainly a latency jitter loss and, and a whole bunch of other conditions and today we're obviously uh, focusing ourselves on latency Unfortunately, in a lot of labs, this is where testing and development is today. And that is the tester or developer has a perfect LAN available. And the problems with that are that uh, unless uh, we get it into uh, the real network quite early, we can find we've made all of our testing on our most perfect LAN, fast and reliable with no other traffic. And then, okay, we can be really surprised by how it behaves in the real world networks. The whole idea um, uh, is that uh, with iTrinity's uh, virtual test network tools, which I've sort of come to at the end of this um, you don't have to you don't have to do that let's begin with uh, what is latency I think it's pretty obvious to most of you but you know the definition of that is how long it takes uh, for to get from one part of the network to the other I don't mean walk so this is how long it takes a packet uh, to get across from say the client to the server uh, through all the uh, routers that may be involved in that from data center to data center if they're communicating with each other or from user to user if we're directly communicating it's often measured um, as something called a round trip time, RTT, uh, the kind of thing we get out of ping. Data, which is kind of a subset of the whole um, latency thing because it is a form of delay, um, is usually associated with variable amounts of latency where we're not getting consistent amounts. So different packets get slowed down and, and delayed by different amounts. But the term jitter is actually completely incorrect um, for um, the uh, computer networking industry um, because um, jitter really applies to electrical signals and the leading edge of, a, of an electrical wave. The correct term in the, in the computing industry is packet delay variation or PDV. But even I'm going to, in the rest of this call, um, assume that for us, jitter and PDV are one and the same thing. So what causes latency? So here we go. The very first thing is not what we might think of. One is insufficient bandwidth. If you don't have enough bandwidth, if you try to push uh, 10 megabits down a 5 megabit pipe, um, it, will call, it will start queuing um, at that restriction if you, if you push too many packets through. And of course, uh, the ones in the queue are get delayed then eventually they come through and obviously unless you give up on your 10 uh, megabits eventually uh, the queue won't cope with it and you'll also get lost but that's the subject of another day 
Another thing that surprisingly causes uh, some latency is packet serialization. So if you've got a 65, uh, 64, uh, uh, if you've got a, uh, I wrote killer, I wrote, uh, yeah, if you've got a 64 byte packet, uh, then uh, it needs to be turned from bytes onto bits on the wire. So at a very low rate, like 64 kilobits, that can take a whole eight milliseconds from the first bit in the packet to the last bit in the packet to serialize. So you get latency just from that. So slow speed networks introduce latency just through the serialization time. One of the most common methods of getting latency is distance. Obviously, if we go up over satellites, uh, you know, all that distance up to the satellite and back, we have large amounts of latency. But even when we go uh, between point A and point B uh, on, uh, if you like, on the surface of the Earth, it's rarely a direct path. And so distance plays a major factor. But also along the way do the routers, switches and repeaters uh, that are there to collect and retransmit our packet through uh, the multiple hops and things that we uh, can see. And they'll be holding those packets uh, for a short time during transmission, and that all adds to the latency as well. As I say, it's a, it's a subject of a, a very large amount of discussion to discuss all methods, but those are some of the main ones. Those of you in computer networking already know this, but just, just to remind us all that if we want to send a large amount of data over an IP network, it's going to be broken down to, into smaller things called packets. I show them here as these little parcels. It's an important factor because um, how the network treats those packets um, uh, becomes important in what goes on. Whatever you're doing, whether you're um, transferring files over HTTP or HTTPS or FTP or SSH or SIP or SIFS or something like that, um, or if you're using a streaming type protocol, or RSTP, uh, uh, MPEG dash, HTTP, uh, HLS for HTTP live streaming and so on, all of those, um, you are you are in the end in all likelihood, except for very rare cases, going to be layered on top of one of these two IP family protocols, TCP or UDP. And I've called them OSI layer four protocols. In TCP IP, they're often referred to as layer three protocols because TCP IP uh, counts the layers differently. And I want to get into layers. But what I'm really saying is, if you're using HTTP or any of those protocols in the TCP, uh, in the use by here, um, you are fundamentally using TCP. If you're using uh, any of these type of protocols, you're fundamentally using UDP. And the, def the difference is that TCP is a guaranteed transport. And what that makes sure is, make, what that means is that some packets will be transmitted and then an acknowledgement is required that they've come successfully from the other end. UDP is much more like sending someone a text message. Unless you have a private agreement with them uh, that you're going to get a text back to show that it's arrived, you don't necessarily know that that's the case. Um, so, so these are our two transport uh, protocols. If I go uh, delve a bit more into TCP, um, then uh, I'm going to represent my packages of information uh, by uh, by by vehicles along the way. So, uh, so. That's uh, that's uh, the process. So in step one, uh, someone sends some data that's on my multiple vehicles, but um, I have to pause after that, after I've sent a certain number of vehicles to make sure I've uh, a vehicle comes back from the other side, a packet comes back from the other side, telling us that um, uh, we, they have got there successfully. Then I can send more and so on. So that's essentially the TCP process. If you go looking around the internet, you'll find diagrams like this. This is a, uh, a, time, uh, a time sort of, uh, type diagram that shows on the left the client and on the right so uh, time is running down the page here so here is my packet leaving the client and it crosses some point at which we might measure um, and get to the server TCP begins uh, with uh, with some uh, some interchange, which is called the three-way handshake, and you can look this up if you want. And only after that's been established can you send some uh, some packets in one direction or the other. And of course, they're all acknowledged on the way. If you want to think about this uh, a bit better, a good way is to think of how you might make a telephone call to someone. So if I was to call you up, um, first of all, I would dial your number, and then uh, I would wait for an answer from the other end. First of all, pick up the phone, and then probably a hello after that so you can start to see the handshake and it's only after that uh, that we can start the chat uh, and uh, I'm, I may start that chat and if particularly if it's a long amount of chat we have a protocol between us where um, uh, I'm going to assume you've gone away if I don't get the occasional yep aha 
And you can see how similar that is to the TCP protocol. So if you think of it like that, so that means there's only a certain amount I should be talking. <laughs> we all know people who, who never noticed, by the way. So clearly they don't require a yep or aha, but there we are. So the whole concept of TCP is your transmission is guaranteed and lost data is resent. Just as if I didn't get a yeah, aha, I'd probably start to, did you hear that? Um, and I'd repeat myself. Um, how much data can you send before you require acknowledgement? The answer is that's not a fixed amount. That's controlled by this thing called the TCP window size. And this is a bit of uh, a times black magic. Um, this, this parameter is not one for a, whole, for a whole computer or a whole mobile phone. It can vary from application to application. Uh, and typically these days is, um, is a self-adjusting parameter, uh, which the system tries to, uh, to increase if it thinks it's possible and necessary and decrease when, when things are going wrong. So when is, it, when is it going to do those things? The answer is it'll increase it if there's not too much loss going on or rather no loss it would prefer because then it feels like it can safely send that data, a lot of it, not requiring much in the way of acknowledgement because the problem is that if it does lose any of the data, it has to send all of that data again, including stuff that may have successfully arrived, uh, arrived, yeah, arrived at the other end. So uh, I've just got a little bit of data on the right hand side in the chart here to give you an idea. Uh, way back, uh, way back a little, a little while ago, not that long ago, TCP window size were typically on average about 64 kilobytes. And at 64 kilobytes, here are some things. So if you have, say, a latency of uh, 20 milliseconds round round trip, which might be between two cities. Um, then, um, then uh, when I want to transmit um, a certain package of data, I won't go into a uh, standardized package of data that would take 100 and, uh, 105 seconds to do, but it would only reach a peak of nine megabits a second, no matter how big and fat the network pipe was. In other words, it was just delayed by having to wait for acknowledgements. So obviously if I can increase the window size, the amount of unacknowledged data, I could get that up. Uh, if I double this, I'll, I'll pretty well um, uh, double uh, double the uh, rate of transfer, assuming I've got it say 100 megabits. So we can make that better. So as I say, modern systems do this and they do it without you noting, but sometimes the window size is suboptimal and manipulating the window size yourself is pretty tricky if you're, if you're sort of on the administrator side. If you're writing the application, there are things you can do with sockets. Let's turn to UDP for a moment. UDP-based protocols um, aren't looking at things the same way. So here I've got my steady, steady set of cars. This might represent um, uh, snapshots of a voice uh, conversation, you know, sort of individual parts. And perhaps these vehicles I've got there, which amount to packets are, say, uh, one hundredth of a second apart. Um, the problem with our network is, as I said, due to congestion, everything else that goes on, they don't necessarily arrive that way. Uh, what I've got here um, is the arrival pattern. There's my packets leaving very nicely. Here's the arrival pattern. So there's an initial delay and that's our base latency. Uh, and then you can see that's been delayed by a steady amount. So it's packet number two, but packet number three has fallen behind a bit. This gap has increased. And this is the jitter thing uh, coming in here. But then um, the next packet is the same distance back from that, but that means it's also too late. Packet five is in, it, in the right position and is hot on the heels of four. So you can see how jitter causes larger and smaller gaps uh, to occur. Um, so um, if, if there's too much initial delay, that's uh, the delay um, in this period, then some of the real timeness has gone. We've all experienced that in certain telephone and video conference calls where there's just too much delay from the other side and it becomes unusable for us. Um, at the streaming protocols, as I say, stream of these even, uh, even uh, uh, packets, but they don't arrive evenly spaced, which is a which is a bit of a problem because when we come to play them back on our audio streams or our video streams or whatever else it is, we have to play them back evenly, which means we've got to store them. We store them in this thing called a jitter buffer, probably more properly called an anti-jitter buffer because we're trying to get rid of the jitter. So we want to stabilize that for smooth playback. But if we use too much buffer, then too much buffer means we're effectively causing delay ourselves and we're back to the problems up here uh, of too much delay. We sometimes get customers of our own product saying, uh, I want to put in a certain amount of jitter, but it's pretty clear when you look at these diagrams, there's only a certain amount of jitter you can put in. You can't have more jitter than the interpacket gap. Um, so here's uh, here's a couple of vehicles, and here's where we tried to, uh, you know, tried to make uh, it jitter too much. In the end, that this isn't possible in a network because the packets have to have, you know, there has to be a tiny amount of gap between them. They can't overlap. 
So some, sometimes people say, oh, give me this much jitter, but you can't because it just doesn't, just there isn't the room for that car, if you like, in the middle, this one here, to move any further than the constraints of the, of the cars in front and behind. And that's the same with packets. So a little bit of a, a very quick walkthrough um, of um, iTrinity's capability in terms of uh, of delay uh, of delay and jitter. So I'm going to I'm going to come over here where I've already uh, uh, to save time set up uh, set up an environment for you. Uh, this is uh, this is the uh, Anyone's uh, 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 dashboard for those of you who haven't seen it. I've logged on a little while ago. I've got three PCs. Uh, I've got three PCs running um, here, um, and they're passing data through. Um, uh, they're passing data through this link here. So um, I can obviously um, I can obviously demonstrate to you that even on the basic screen, if I was to say from 10 to 20 here and say OK and update uh, there, then changes have been made. And um, looking at the three PCs that are all running packets through there, um, they uh, they are now getting that. You'll notice it's actually double what I say because on the basic screen, um, the the um, the uh, latency is represented as one way. So so the same amount is applied to the, the forward direction and the reverse direction. So there you can see these larger values. So you can see even though the word jitter isn't mentioned on this screen, there's clearly jitter here. Uh, Windows sends out pings once per second. So so um, because I'm asking for jitters uh, between 10, 10 and 20, which amounts to round trip time delays of between 20 and 40 milliseconds, that's easily within the one second gaps that we allow. So back to that slide I just mentioned, that means the packets are not constrained by the distance between themselves. The moment I start to use one second gaps, yes, that affects the whole thing because Windows says sending these packets one second apart. So um, that's certainly not all we can do. And in the last session, um, you saw I uh, had gone into advanced features. In fact, um, uh, the NE1 emulator uh, and its uh, INE cousin have um, have a far greater capability than that. And I took you through on a quick tour in the last session through all of the things here, but we're really interested in latency here. And you can see the kind of latencies we have. We, we have this one here called fixed delay with jitter. As I said, even the random delay that we're using currently effectively uh, puts jitter in but uh, we have fixed delay with jitter so you can look at it a different way this is the base late base latency uh, plus the jit uh, plus plus a jitter amount so it's 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 fundamentally the same as random but expressed in a different way um, and that's so that you can think of it as it takes 20 milliseconds to get from point a to point b but there's a certain amount of variation in that as i say it amounts the same as the random delay Another distribution that definitely has jitter in it is the Gaussian distribution. Um, so um, what I'm going to do, um, what I'm going to do very quickly is to just uh, stabilize, uh, stabilize the latency. I'm just going to make it zero. So now I'm no longer using even amounts of latency in this direction. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to use the Gaussian distribution. I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say that it's uh, 20 um, with a max of 500 uh, and a min of uh, 10 uh, and a standard deviation of two. So there will be jitter in this. Let's take a look at um, what we get from that. Um, so what we get from that is a much tighter uh, a much tighter kind of uh, kind of value in in our uh, in our jitter because what we asked for uh, what we asked for was uh, the mean to be 20 and with the standard deviation of two we want most of that data to be plus or minus two there is a probability of getting all the way up to 500 but it's very small on the Gaussian so Gaussian distribution can be very good so fundamentally look at all of these distributions and they all pretty well have jitter implicit in them plus a fixed uh, plus a certain amount of fixed latency depending on how you use them. So certainly there's plenty of, uh, plenty of choices for you there. The very last one um, forces a certain interpacket gap. Um, that's what we looked at in that last diagram. There isn't the time to show all of these, but I, I, wanted, uh, I wanted to look at that. So uh, whatever you're testing, whether it's a website or something like that, um, uh, you can set up your links appropriately. And of course, uh, those of you who've seen the anyone in, in, our, in, our, uh, in our previous webinars realize I can set up multi-links and can put these through PCs through different links. 
I'm not going to do that now, but I am going to I'm going to switch to to do something a little bit different at the moment. Um, what I'd what I'd like to do is um, I'm just going to bring up this, uh, and this is almost a warning uh, a warning for people who are dealing with uh, what they believe to be streaming. This is uh, this is called Abbey Road. Uh, this is called Abbey Road Cam. I like it because people do all sorts of uh, ridiculous things in in front of uh, the camera here or on Abbey Road. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to actually go back to basic mode. I'm going to I'm going to nullify uh, the latency. So we just have a lovely, uh, a lovely perfect circuit there. You can see that reflected in the pink. So what I'll do now is I'm going to refresh uh, the Abbey Road uh, camera screen with a bit of luck and uh, that will just uh, refresh itself uh, there uh, and get the stream running again. It's a uh, pretty Oh, hello. I uh, didn't have that last time I was here. We'll just accept their cookies. There you go. So, uh, uh, so there you are. There's uh, here. Here you're going to see people trying to kill themselves on Abbey Road, but that's incidental to uh, to the rest of this. Um, they're trying to be the Beatles, or, or perhaps uh, uh, perhaps uh, the Genesis impression of the Beatles on that crossing. Okay, so I'm going to look at bits uh, cent per second uh, in this. Uh, uh, and I'll also look at packets and per second. I'm just graphing those on this link because um, everyone thinks this is a live camera and everyone thinks that this camera is using UDP based protocols and streaming. And for those of you who, who um, will be very interested in the shape of graph, uh, this graph is going to tell me that in fact you realize that it isn't streaming. If it was streaming, it would be maintaining a constant bit or constant packet rate for, uh, for, for the frames. Instead, what it's doing is it, this camera is running over TCP. So whatever they're, they're running is over TCP and they buffer in a bit and then they don't need to get any more data and they don't get data is these troughs you see there and then they need to buffer in a whole lot more yes on average they're probably running at about four megabits a second but they've got peaks of up to seven and a half so if we were to have a bandwidth limit and squash it queuing would begin exactly as we talked about earlier as I said, uh, there's not too much time. That's really um, that's really all uh, the time I have. Uh, uh, that's really all the time I have uh, for uh, for talking about latency today. As I say, a very big topic in its own right. Uh, just cross over these. I skipped that one uh, in the interest of time. And I'm going to now hand back uh, to Phil um, for the uh, for the Q and A session. And I'll uh, just. Uh, just go on to myself on uh, mute for a minute, if I if I can. My my mouse isn't going. So, Phil, um, what, 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 uh... Okay, I've got a couple of questions for you here, Frank. Uh, a couple of short ones. First one is, is lag the same as latency? Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Phil. <clears throat> um, I recognise uh, we've probably got a gamer amongst our audience there, because uh, lag often a term used in, in gaming. The answer is that latency can certainly cause lag. It's not the only cause of lag. Sometimes it's the performance of the client or the server itself that's responsible for lag. But yes, um, yes, latency can certainly contribute to lag. And in some cases, um, it can affect the performance of games, both, uh, both uh, detrimentally and players have used it to their advantage advantage where sometimes they will cause uh, almost no traffic to flow and then they'll allow it to burst through a court, you know letting their characters apparently hyperspace over from one place to another thank you for that frank uh, have another question here is it possible to simulate real world latency and how the the main method for simulating real world latency is to measure um, that latency, uh, that of course, that of course is uh, is more tricky than it might seem. But um, uh, there are there are um, a large amount of monitoring tools out there. People often start with tools like Ping um, as a guide, but um, the uh, the protocol used by Ping, ICMP, which is neither TCP nor UDP, may have a different priority in the network. So various tools have sprung up that actually measure um, traffic that is already flowing through networks and try to gauge the latency in those networks. Works. So uh, that's really um, that's really it. After that, we uh, can attempt to retrieve uh, the latency values from those tools and aim to plug them in. If it's a varying latency, uh, we need to use uh, the anyone's uh, scenario tool, which can vary uh, things uh, over time automatically. Thank you, Frank. Just one final question: Why did you talk about RTT latency? 
in your presentation. Let's, um, so the simple answer to so RTT as on the slide is um, is uh, round trip time. And the reason is that the easiest way to, well, way to measure latency between points is to effectively use products like ping, which use a passive, something passive at the other end, like a router or, or, or a server to reply. And so we don't get to measure the one way latency. We only get to measure the round trip. So how long it takes to get there and back. So um, uh, some of you who are more sophisticated might realize that there isn't any guarantee uh, that the one-way latency in, a, in either direction will be half the round trip but it is a common assumption made in, in, in most uh, in most modeling uh, as it's very hard uh, to measure otherwise where customers really require to measure one-way latency then devices are needed at both ends that usually uh, require um, some very solid uh, real-time clocks perhaps uh, using uh, GPS clocks um, uh, to do them and as I say that's just not a simple thing to do, especially buried perhaps in a in a deep in a computer room. Okay, thanks, Frank. Obviously, as you say, latency is a, a subject you could talk on for a long, long time. But conscious of of time, so there's no further questions now. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you, Phil. Okay. And as you can see, this is part of a series of refresher sessions that we've been staging. Um, as you can see there on the slide, there's been four previous to this. Um, all of those are available. Um, if you go to the training courses page uh, and scroll down to the any one section, you'll be able to, to watch them there at your leisure. And then as we say, as it's part of the series, coming up will be packet loss. Uh, in a couple of weeks time and we also look at duplication re reordering and fragmentation and bit error and yet again all the details on those are available on the training page and just a reminder that the product itself has 11 video tutorials included in it and obviously you can look at the user manuals and the various documentation again if you go to the any one page on the website you'll be able to find those and download them. And of course, there is the iTrinity YouTube channel where we host all our videos as well. Okay, so it just remains for me to say thank you for everybody. That uh, concludes today's session. Um, thank you, Frank, for the presentation and demonstration. Um, I say thank you everyone for attending and we look forward to working you on to the next one. And we will send you the recording as soon as it becomes available. Thanks very much. Goodbye.